Um, the only thing that's left for me to say is thanks everybody for joining. I hope you've enjoyed this three part series. And obviously thanks to Mihai for giving up his time. If there's any questions, comments uh, that we don't cover today, stick them up in the meetup group. Um, the other two replays are there. So I'll get this replay up as soon as possible as well. So thanks very much and over to you Mihai. Hey, thank you very much, Luke. Uh, so just bear with me one second here as I uh, start sharing my screen. As uh, things go, let me see. Okay. Are you able to see something? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so my name is Mihai Kevetti. I am the CTO for Cloud Native and Red Hat Solutions at IBM. I'm also a um, OpenShift certified and uh, Red Hat certified uh, engineer. And I'm going to walk you through a couple of the options that you have to get started with uh, containers, Kubernetes, or OpenShift on your machines, on your laptops, or on your own. Give you an overview of what OpenShift is and how it can help you and then see if we can deploy a couple of things on OpenShift. I'm also going to introduce a new feature that is generally available as of OpenShift 4.5, uh, namely OpenShift virtualization, which lets you manage and build not only containers on top of the OpenShift container platform, but also virtual machines. So you can have an environment where virtual machines using KVM and OpenShift coexist, but are managed using Kubernetes objects, and you're able to interact with them using the uh, software-defined networks and other management elements of Kubernetes. So first, let's take a look at some of the workloads that you can typically deploy and manage using a Kubernetes platform. Cloud-native applications, we all know that containerized applications, cloud-native applications, microservices, uh, tend to do fairly well with a automated platform that is able to orchestrate multiple workloads um, on top of Kubernetes, AI and machine learning. So you can even have bare metal worker nodes in your Kubernetes clusters and your OpenShift clusters, uh, where you can take advantage of the performance of a bare metal uh, server, but also interact with things like GPUs. So you can deploy TensorFlow or uh, use Kubeflow or other types of uh, tools to deploy AI machine work, uh, learning workflows analytics, and you can also have big data and other tools, IoT, so you can deploy these things at the edge. And many companies are deploying OpenShift clusters um, in their own edge locations. So for example, automotive clients are deploying this on their manufacturing plants. And we even have uh, cars which are running Kubernetes today. And we even have satellites which are running OpenShift or Kubernetes in space. So Edge tends to be a very, very exciting thing within, uh, within the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, by the way, does anyone know which, which car is running a Kubernetes platform? You can just type it in or show of hands, or if not, I'm just going to ask Luke. <laughs> I was going to no. take a punt at, at Tesla, just because they seem quite cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're spot on, you're spot on. Um, yes, Tesla is one of them. And they're also developing their own chips for things like AI and machine learning and so on to do a lot of analytics at the edge. Um, in fact, 5G uh, is also one of the exciting areas for OpenShift and Kubernetes platforms as virtually 5G is spreading all these um, 5G locations, right? Hundreds of thousands of locations and having edge clusters which can run micro um, services tends to be a very, very useful thing, thing in the 5G industry. Uh, also within the um, telco space, um, OpenStack used to be the most popular distribution or the most popular thing that ran in edge locations for telco providers. Um, VMware might be big in enterprise, but all of the telcos run um, you know, open function virtualization, network function virtualization, all these things on top of OpenStack. Uh, if you haven't heard of OpenStack in a while, well, it's really big in telco. 
Um, but uh, OpenShift is, seems to be the new thing there as with the ability, the added ability to run, run virtual machines and microservices, a lot of telco providers are looking towards um, future Kubernetes platforms that can run at the edge. So developing applications on top of the OpenShift container platform gives you the capabilities that you get with cloud native and DevOps. Uh, applications. You can develop traditional uh, applications as well on top of virtual machines. You can develop uh, cloud native applications and you can even develop applications which are accelerated by machine learning and do these across um, edge locations in your own data center on top of IBM Cloud, Azure, AWS, um, Alibaba, if that's your thing, um, across a hybrid multi-cloud platform. The idea here is that you're not developing your applications for an edge location. You're not developing your applications for a hybrid cloud location. You're developing your applications for a container platform with a predictable um, lifecycle, with a predictable API. And then whether you're in an edge location or any of the hybrid or multi-cloud um, options, you are developing it for OpenShift, for Kubernetes. It will run anywhere, everywhere. Um, a lot of our customers tend to use um, OpenShift not only in the enterprise, um, but they tend to use it in an innovative way. So they put it in devices, appliances. Um, we even have, for example, one customer uh, which is putting OpenShift in all of their uh, stores as an edge location. Because typically within stores, um, you would see a lot of let's say traditional platforms, right? Things from the 80s, 90s um, that run the store locations, perform all the operations in a disconnected way, and then send all that information to central, what is processed, people do analytics, they know their sales, their revenues, um, they have information on the stocks and they're able to perform uh, all of that activity. And as you could probably tell, an edge location is not a data center. They don't have proper power, they don't have proper cooling. Um, and they don't have a system administrator who's going to go in there and manage everything for the customer. So you need to have a platform that's easy to deploy, easy to manage, and can be centralized. So having features like the advanced cluster management capability where you can manage hundreds of thousands of clusters uh, of Kubernetes worldwide through a single uh, API and being able to deploy and manage these clusters in remote locations and having the added benefit um, where you have high availability and failover um, where you can say, hey, I have these free servers. I'm going to ship them to my edge location. One of them goes down, no issues. I have that type of failover across the platform. It tends to be very beneficial. Um, as you could probably tell, things in remote locations like your store fail a lot more often because they don't have proper power, cooling, dust gets in, people bang on the server. Somebody steps on a network cable, it can be very, uh, very disruptive. Now, some of the challenges that we typically see with Kubernetes uh, happen when you try to scale out, right? So container security tends to be the biggest one we see. Um, folks tend to develop container images by, sorry to say it, pulling random things off of Docker Hub and saying, this is my image, I'm going to put my application on top of it and hope that everything works. And you've seen in our pre two previous sessions, there's better ways to manage the life cycle of your images. There's ways to get image scanning in place, uh, patching, compliance, and all sort of things. Now, if you're just developing things on your own, maybe that's not a big deal for you. Uh, but some of the um, companies we work with tend to be highly regulated. So you'll see, for example, banks and financial services institutions. Um, they don't seem to like it if their platform is not compliant. So even if you're a store and you're processing uh, credit cards, then you need to have your system compliant with PCI regulations. And pulling that random container or pulling some random um, distribution or trying to build your own container platform doesn't go very well with regulators as you're unable to source and identify who's created it. Is there a Trojan hiding in it? Who's providing me with the patches and support and management and so on across the entire life cycle? The second issue we face uh, tends to be with installation upgrades and maintenance. And I'm going to cover uh, quickly how um, a feature called 
IPI or installer provision infrastructure or basically a way to deploy OpenShift automatically using one command across any cloud provider can help you in that area. So all the installation is taken care of automatically for you. Monitoring, metering, and management of the platform is also an issue. So day to operations, right? How do you ensure that the applications that I have are actually part of an ecosystem where I have the monitoring in place? Um, one of the issues we typically face within this cloud native space is that people want to work on the cool, th cool stuff, right? So I'm going to ask you, what is cool? Uh, developing shiny new applications and building new applications and building new container platforms or maintaining them for the next 10 years and patching them and making sure that nothing goes wrong and monitoring them. And, uh, <laughs> um, the answer to that is usually obvious, right? Uh, people with the cutting edge skills will always want to work on the new, new thing, right? It's called resume-driven development. <laughs> so... Um, you know, they'll always deploy the latest beta software, alpha software, version 001 software, uh, because that seems cool. They'll go to CNCF uh, and take a look at those things. And it usually doesn't work uh, too well when you try to maintain it across a number of years for a customer uh, where you want your system. And this should be the goal of every develop developer. And it's going to sound stupid, but uh, if something is called uh, legacy, that probably means it made money at some point, <laughs> um, right? It's not your development platform. It It's transitioned into something that brings value for the business. It's something that works. You do need to improve upon it, but it goes into a much more predictable uh, life cycle where the focus is going to be a lot more on ensuring that platform remains operational with 99.95 or 99.99% SLAs. Uh, while you develop the next thing in another iteration. So having that predictable life cycle for your applications uh, tends to be key. But how do we combine or we marry these two concepts together? Uh, DevOps, where you have continuous delivery of value for the business with ensuring that things tend to, main, to be maintained uh, to a decent level of um, availability. In concepts such as SRE uh, tend to help here, site reliability engineering, uh, or even applying something like chaos testing within your environments. Uh, other issues that we tend to, to face are, how do we automate this platform so we can make it manage itself? And that's an interesting question, right? Uh, typically with data operations, as I've man mentioned, uh, people get bored very fast, right? They always want to work in, on developing the new thing. So what if we were to do operations the same way that we do development? How do you develop an application today? Well, you write some code, you put it on GitHub, you commit it, and you push it out. It goes through a CI/CD pipeline. And then at the end of your CI/CD pipeline, you'll have a package. The package gets built, it gets pushed to production, and there you go. Well, there is a way to perform operations in a similar way. Um, I'm going to introduce to you something called the operator hub. So the operator hub is a way to manage, build, and package applications for Kubernetes platforms that include the operational knowledge as part of the operator itself. So an operator is a piece of software written in Go or in Ansible that talks to your Kubernetes or OpenShift API that's part of a catalog of operators that automates things across capability levels. So if you look here at the capability levels, uh, what you will see, let me see if I can find uh, a better slide that shows this uh, operator capability level. There we go. So it looks a bit like this. Level one is basic install. You're able to automatically provision an application and do configuration management. Level two is seamless upgrades. So, so far, so good. We know Helm can do this as well, right? You can use a Helm chart or you can use a template, um, JSON, YAML, whatever it is, dump it on your Kubernetes platform, and you're able to install and to upgrade your applications. Now, here's where the fun part comes in, phase three, phase four, phase five. 
So if you're looking at Ansible as an example, or Go as an example to automate what your application does, you're going to take all of the operational knowledge that you've built in packaging, maintaining, pr providing high availability, disaster recovery, failure recovery, storage lifecycle, metrics, alerts, monitoring, logging, metering, horizontal and vertical auto-scaling, configuration management and tuning, uh, abnormal detection, and automate all of those steps using Ansible or go against the OpenShift or Kubernetes APIs, package them in your application, and deploy them back onto the operator hub. So let's take a look at some of the operators we're going to have here. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, let me see if I can give you an example from production. So here I have a cluster. I have a cluster of OpenShift. My cluster of OpenShift is running version 4.5.6. I have a number of worker nodes, as you can see here. It's a combination of virtual worker nodes. So this is a uh, 16 vCPU, 64 gig uh, memory virtual worker node, and a bare metal worker node. So a bare metal worker node can run KVM without using a uh, nested hypervisor. Uh, they're split into worker pools that can scale based out on demand. And on top of these, I can deploy and I can manage as part of an OpenShift cluster using operators, my applications and my middleware. So typically in OpenShift, the biggest, biggest issue or within Kubernetes, the biggest issue that you have is how do you manage state? Everybody knows that containers are stateless, right? You deploy a container and then when your worker nodes goes down or your container stops and is deleted, then your data goes away. So how do you persist the state? Well, typically you put it onto some kind of a storage. It can be local storage which is kind of a no-no if you think about it, right? Local storage is on your worker node. What happens if your worker node dies? Well, not a lot of good things, right? How do you scale that? Well, maybe you're going to put it into a shared storage so you can create a persistent volume, a persistent volume claim uh, to, to attach that to a container. And now you have some kind of storage. Maybe you're using NFS or iSCSI or Ceph or Gluster or some other kind of dynamic storage. Yep. Is that a question? Ian? Hello? Oh, sorry, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you have questions, if anyone has questions, feel free to type them in or um, pretty much go ahead and ask them out right. I'm going to try to answer them as best I can here on the call. So let's take a look at how we can manage state using operators. So let's say that we need to manage a database for my application. I'm going to go to my operator catalog in OpenShift Container Platform. I'm going to select database, and then I'm going to pick a database that I like. Now, my favorite database happens to be PostgreSQL. Very traditional, very SQL, but <laughs> it is what it is. Um, and as you can see here, I have an option to deploy an operator for Postgres. There's actually a number of operators from different vendors. And I have an operator here called uh, Crunchy PostgreSQL for OpenShift. The first one I can deploy here is a operator uh, from the marketplace. So this comes with support from the vendor. Uh, so I can go and I can get support from Crunchy for the next 10 years. Uh, if I have any issues, they can provide me with vendor support. And just like everything that Red Hat does, like everything within the open source community, you don't need to get the support. We can also deploy an open source version of the operator. It's exactly the same thing, except without a person to help you on the other end. So there's Crunchy PostgreSQL for OpenShift. You can see here, this is an autopilot operator. And let's take a look at some of these things that this operator does for me, right? I can run a production grade PostgreSQL as a service option directly on OpenShift. So instead of me deploying a container, for PostgreSQL and then attaching persistent volumes to my container, attaching secrets, encrypting the data, um, providing an upgrade path for my database, uh, creating a cluster with my PostgreSQL operator, then setting up backup, disaster recovery. So how do I fail over? Setting up a load balancer, uh, anti-affinity rules. So if I'm creating a cluster and both of my pods 
are on the same worker nodes, that's a bit of a stupid cluster, ain't it? Uh, well, I get all of this with the operator. Create scale delete Postgres clusters with ease, high availability with anti-affinity rules to help resiliency, disaster recovery built in with PG back rest and include support for incremental differential uh, backups and delta restores, monitoring so I can see um, the performance of my database. I can clone clusters with a simple command. I can customize it as I need to, and I can deploy it onto my cluster. So deployment is literally as simple as me pushing a button here called install. So I'm going to uninstall it just so I can install it and show you uh, just how easy it is. I'm going to select the operator. I'm going to select where I want to install my operator. Let me see. Postgres. Oh, well, I don't have a namespace. So let me create a namespace for, for this one. A namespace is a way to isolate projects from each other, right? So I'm going to uh, create a partition within my OpenShift cluster called uh, Postgres. Database. There we go. This is a Kubernetes namespace, basically. And when I create this namespace, I'm actually able to manage resource quotas, limit ranges, and apply various kinds of restrictions, like number of pods that can be deployed, requests, uh, memory, CPU, uh, and other things. So if I look at the specification uh, here, you'll be able to see, let's take a sample, um, maximum count for every resource. So I can define how many resources my PostgreSQL uh, is able to consume. CPU, memory, objects, uh, connections, whatever you need. I can also set limit ranges. So how much my con container is going to um, consume of each of these resources. And I can also manage the users and uh, uh, across my uh, my project. So going back to the installed um, to the uh, to the operator hub. Now that I'm in the Postgres database namespace, and I can deploy different Postgres clusters in different namespaces, because maybe I have different databases that I want to manage completely differently by different teams. I have a uh, go-to-market team, I have a marketing team, I have a HR team. They all want to manage their own clusters and they don't want to talk to each other, right? So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to install it. Note, those aren't individual databases. You can have multiple databases inside your operator. So I'm going to install it here. I'm going to have an approval strategy of automatic and I'm going to click on install. And once this installs, so it's going to take a few minutes or not. Seems to be rather fast. There we go. <laughs> um, once this is installed, I'll be able to start doing some more interesting things with my OpenShift cluster. Um, so I now have database as a service capability. I can create a primary cluster member, which is an instance of PostgreSQL. I can create a replica on another worker node, which is a replication agent that moves a, my database transaction logs from my primary to my replica, and I create, can create various policies and workflows. So uh, I can literally go here. I can create a cluster of OpenShift. Now, one thing that you need to do is to provide secrets. So um, Postgres, Postgres, secret. Postgres operator token, you'll need to create a secret first. But basically, you're going to be able to deploy a universal base image, which is Red Hat Enterprise Linux with Postgres SQL, with secrets, uh, with ports, and you'll be able to uh, connect to your um, operator and just manage an example uh, database from this view. Once you have a database in place, you'll be able to create additional replicas or uh, set up your backup policies, your performance, your storage, and other things across your cluster. 
going back to the operator hub, uh, you'll see that a lot of the operators that exist here are either developed by Red Hat or certified or developed by the community. Uh, certified basically means that they've gone through security, performance, testing, tested against every single version. They are supported. They have a workflow behind it. Uh, so, you know, it's not just some random piece of code. It's something that's gone through rigorous uh, testing to ensure that it works and you have no issues across a variety of features. There's also uh, things like OpenShift Container Storage, which deploys Ceph clusters uh, that you can manage similar to having your own S3 and similar to having your own NFS and iSCSI servers. Uh, there's operators for uh, networking, monitoring, security, storage, messaging. So if you want to deploy something like Kafka uh, or if you want to deploy something like MQ, you have the options to deploy those as operators as well. Uh, multiple databases, including TIDB, which is a distributed version of uh, MySQL. So all the databases you can uh, possibly need. All the popular ones are here. And of course, you can write, write your own. And operators for cloud providers. So if you want to manage services in Azure or AWS or any other platform, IBM Cloud, it's also there. And the last thing I want to show you is the operator for OpenShift Virtualization. Now, this operator is special. Uh, what it does is on CoreOS or your worker node operating system, it will spin up a KVM capability. So if I take a look at my um, OpenShift operator for OpenShift virtualization, you'll see here that I have an instance called Hyperconverged, which gives me the capability to run, in addition to my pods, I can run virtual machines. As you can see, I'm running Fedora and Rahat Enterprise Linux within the same um, namespace. I have it here. So this is Fedora. Let's take a look a bit at the console. I have internet access on my machine. And it's basically just like a regular uh, machine. Take a look at the disk, you'll see that it's a 20 gigabyte disk. And this disk is actually attached here as a Vertio interface disk uh, using a storage class, uh, which goes against my cloud provider. You can use HostPath, you can use NFS, iSCSI, uh, AWS, Azure, anything that is supported by Kubernetes as dynamic or static storage, you can use it here uh, for your disks. So. Um, that's one of the advantages when you're using it. So as you can see here, I have a lot of disks that are managed automatically when I add my uh, workload. So let's take a look at how you would deploy a virtual machine. I can start with import. So if I have Raha virtualization or VMware, I can just point at my VMware instance and suck the workload out, run it on OpenShift. Or another path to create it is with a wizard. Let's say I'm going to create for the R32, um, 33, because that's new. E for beta. I'm going to select the source. I can pixie boot it. I can give it a URL to a QCOW image. So this is a QCOW2 image, the same image that you'd use on AWS or IBM Cloud to deploy um, from your own image, the same image that you'd use with Rahab Virtualization or OpenStack, the same image that you use with KVM. So you can easily build these images with QM or KVM or any other tool such as Packer. I can select the operating system, Windows, Red Hat, Fedora, or any other thing like Ubuntu or Debian, but those are not officially supported. They work just fine though. I can define the size. So I'm going to give it a custom here. Let's say I want to give it two gigs and two vCPU. And the workflow work profile, you can give it desktop or high performance or server. I can select the networking, so this is really cool. Uh, you can actually use Maltus and you can have multiple network interface connections and connect to whatever um, network you have within your cluster. Uh, you can do firewall, you can do advanced things there. And my root disk, so here you can use a storage class uh, which exists. As you can see here, I have OCS, which is my own storage that I manage. I also use block and file storage with my cloud provider. So I can select a class, a storage class here and the type of 
access. So if I want to have shared access, read, write, execute, or single access, uh, allowing me to um, just access this uh, container. If I want to have shared access, I can do some more advanced clustering capabilities. Uh, I also have something called Cloudinate. So if you know what Cloudinate is, it's basically a way to customize the deployment of your image. So you can insert an SSH key into it. Um, you can insert, um, a, basically it's your public key, not your private key. Um, you can customize the username, the password, pseudo access. It's a way to run stuff. So how they need. It's basically a Python thing that sits inside the image that you build. And it allows you to customize the initialization of your um, can, of your um, image. So you can build it and you can configure it uh, using a variety of um, post install scripts. Now, uh, going to the next step, you'll see that you can have CD-ROMs attached as virtual hardware, and then you'll be able to confirm your changes, changes and uh, start your machine on creation. I don't believe I'm going to be able to create this one. Let's see. Uh, mostly due to resources, but uh, hopefully I have enough to, to boot this new one as well. So I have a fairly small cluster here. Let's see if it's able to obtain uh, the necessary CPU and uh, memory resources. Yeah, so let me look at the worker nodes here. Compute nodes. Actually, I think it should be sufficient because I'm not using a lot of the resources here with my uh, my pods and my uh, my clusters. So I think I should be good. Okay, so going back to the presentation, I'm going to um, give you an overview of what we're going to do in the homework, or you know what you can do um, at home as you deploy your own cluster or you play around with these capabilities and give you a small demo how you can get started. So with OpenShift, you don't just get a Kubernetes platform, you get a container OS. So um, the installation, configuration, and management of the operating system is done automatically for you using Core OS. Various things like operators, over-the-air updates, monitoring, logging, registry, storage, and routing, as well as the platform application data services, development services, and multi-cluster um, management, all with automated installation, support for virtual machine uh, management, support for automatic updates, comprehensive container security, and other tools. So let's take a look at how this would play out in practice. Uh, you're going to do some of these things yourself if you're interested in, uh, uh, in going through the next steps. But basically, uh, the idea is to set up a very, very small um, test bench where you're going to deploy a database and something like a WordPress container, build it yourself. Then you're going to install tools like Code Ready Containers to give you an open shift on your laptop, create a project called WordPress, create users and groups, and set up HD password, uh, set up a cluster and the user, set up a developer, leader, and tester user that have different permissions, uh, deploy MySQL from a registry and configure a secret, deploy WordPress from another registry and configure a secret. Uh, figure out that this image is broken and see how you can fix it. Uh, create a route to test WordPress, scale it out and set up some auto scaling, and then set up some monitoring. Uh, to give you an overview, code ready containers is cloud.rahat.com, and you're able to uh, download a code ready container. It's kind of like Minikube, right? For Mac OS, Windows, or Linux. Uh, you unpack it and you run setup. And this will install code ready containers on your system. You can stop or delete your cluster and then you'll be able to connect to it. So CRC console minus credentials, and then you're going to be able to log on to uh, code ready containers. Now, next step is going to be to create uh, some users so you can use. Um, HT password, or if you have it, LDAP, or other types of authentication, and you'll be able to see some of those as well. 
So let me see. And then you'll be able to create your own um, your own namespaces where you can deploy applications, set up authentication, uh, set up an identity provider, create a cluster admin, create various users and groups, set up self-provisioning so you can provision a cluster, configure a project to give access to various users and groups, set up quotas, and then start to deploy your application. Once you deploy your application, you'll be able to use secrets to manage secrets. Obviously, you can use a secret store. Uh, this is just using literal secrets from the CLI. Deploy your database and then check out the configuration. Uh, you'll also be able to set up a config map. So as you can see here, uh, MySCMP would be a file where you configure the MySQL uh, database. You can also create a config map for that, which maps it to a volume and puts it inside your, uh, your running pod, and then configure your environment using, uh, using secrets. You can test your database by logging into your container remotely, and then you're going to be able to connect things like WordPress uh, and pods to your container, create a service account so you can manage it, expose the application, and do a little bit of cleanup. So delete your application, delete your project. If things don't work, you're able to uh, debug your deployment to check for permissions, so you'll be able to log into your container, and you're even able to deploy a different container to swap out WordPress. So if you think this container is broken, you can replace it with a UBI 8 or RHEL 8 container image to your debugging from there where you have your debugging tools and curl and whatever it is. See if you can talk to your database, install MySQL client, and then swap out the container back. Once you have your applications deployed, you're able to scale out your containers and replicas, uh, create various projects, and as future homework, you can do things like health checks, scale your applications, or use a MySQL operator to manage your database instead. So with that being said, um, you'll find within the next, um, by Monday, a um, file attached on the Meetup page, which points at all the things that you've seen here, if you want to test it out on your own. Um, you can go to uh, cloud.rahat.com uh, to obtain to obtain a copy of uh, code-ready containers, so you'll be able to get it here uh, and install it on your own machine to, to try it out. Um, you can also use OKD if you're interested in a bit more work. So OKD is um, kind of like a cluster. So code-ready containers just spins up a KVM on your machine or virtual machine with all this available for you. Uh, oh, this one, OKD, is the open source community distribution of OpenShift. And this one, um, basically, you can use it to create clusters of OpenShift. Um, but um, it requires a bit more work to, to set up and create your own uh, cluster. Now, any questions before, um, before we complete our call? Any questions before we So uh, just type your questions in or go off mute and um, we can take it from there. Okay, if there are no further questions, keep an eye out for um, some of the offline material and um, We'll probably have a separate session on OpenShift virtualization at some point in the future. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Mihai. Thank you very, very much. Very good. Um, and bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.